NUS Deputy President, Academic Affairs and Provost, Professor Tan Eng Chai, Dr. Alan Wong, and members of the Wong family, colleagues and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2012 Educator in Residence Program, EIRP, Ruth Wong Memorial Lecture on Education, titled Opening Doors, Exploring the Teaching Practices of Inspiring Academics. This lecture will be presented by Professor Ian Hay from Flinders University, Australia. My name is Alan, and I'll be the MC for this afternoon's lecture. The ERRP is part of the CDTL's effort to facilitate active exchanges between the NUS academic community and distinguished educators from around the world. CDTL's first educator in residence was Professor Daniel Bernstein from the University of Kansas, who visited us in 2010. We are really happy to have Professor Ian Hay visit NUS as CDTL's second educator in residence. Besides this public lecture, Prop Hay will participate in several discussions and meetings with members of the NUS teaching community, including graduate teaching assistants. This public lecture is made possible by the generous support of the family of Dr. Ruth Wong He King, founding director of the then Institute of Education in Singapore. Well known for her deep commitment to education, Dr. Ruth Wong was a respected figure in Singapore's education history. She started the Faculty of Education at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. Upon her return to Singapore in 1969, Dr. Wong joined the Ministry of Education as Director of Research and concurrently Principal of the Teachers' Training College, TTC. Single-handedly, Dr. Wong upgraded the TTC to Institute of Education in 1973, which streamlined and improved teacher education considerably. NUS and CDTL are honored to host this distinguished lecture series and we are grateful to Dr. Ruth Wong's family, represented by Dr. Ellen Wong and her family this afternoon for their generosity and support in this endeavor. This will enable us to host and engage top caliber educators who will inspire us, help us imagine, design, and implement new learning experiences for students at all levels. Today, in that spirit, Prof. Hay will be opening a few doors for us to take a peek into the top to what educators do to excite and transform their students. I'm really curious to hear the story he will be unfolding before us. Will it be a series of case studies and scenarios of all which lead to collective wisdom on how to engage with students and how to get them engaged with the subject and with each other? Will it be theory first? And examples later? Do the subjects of his research use technology? And if so, for what purposes and how? Let us wait and see. Professor Hay received a Bachelor of Science, first class honours in geography from the University of Canterbury in 1983. His PhD from the University of Washington as a Fulbright Scholar in 1989, and a higher doctorate also from the University of Canterbury in 2009. He is currently Professor of Geography at Flinders University, South Australia. He was also a former Australia Learning and Teaching Council's Discipline Scholar for the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities. Prop Hay became a Fellow of the Australian College of Educators in 2009 and a Senior Fellow of the Higher Education Academy in 2008. He has had significant advisory roles in projects which enhance the scholarship of teaching and learning in higher education, including as an expert member for the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority Reference Group on the new National Geography Curriculum. Prof Hay has also received several awards for his contributions to enhancing and promoting scholarly and creative teaching, including the Prime Minister's Award for Australian University Teacher of the Year in 2006, and the inaugural Association of American Geographers 
E. Willard and Ruby S. Miller Award in 2010. Professor Hayes' research focuses on geographies of domination and oppression, as well as qualitative methods and research ethics. He has published extensively and taken on editorial roles with several international and regional geography and higher educational journals, such as Applied Geography, Journal of Geography in Higher Education, International Research in Geographical and Environment Education, and Ethics, Place, and Environment. Prof. Hay has written and edited several books, including Inspiring Academics, Learning with the World, Great University Teachers, and Making the Grade, A Guide to Successful Communication and Study. He is also the immediate past president of the Institute of Australian Geographers. Without any further delay, let me, on your behalf, invite Professor Ian Hay to present the 2012 EIRP Roof Wong Memorial Lecture on Education. Professor Hay, please. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for that very, very generous introduction, Alan. And thank you very much, everybody, for coming along this afternoon. Before I get started, what I'd like to do is to offer uh, thanks to a number of people and uh, organisations. First, I'd like to extend my thanks to all of the staff from the Centre for De the Development of Teaching and Learning who have done an extraordinary job in organising the trip for me, who've been very, very hospitable, and I'm thoroughly looking forward to the balance of my time here at National University of Singapore. I'd like to thank the National University of Singapore for making this opportunity possible, and I'd like to offer a special thanks to members of the Wong family who are gathered in the front row here, some of whom I had the occasion to today. It was a very, very stimulating lunch, and I'm delighted to be here, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to give this talk. Um, what I would like to do first is to, well, what I'm planning to do today is to talk on the topic that you can see there on the screen. I hope that you can read it, Opening Doors, Exploring the Practices of Inspiring Academics. I'll come to some of that in a moment, but what I would like to do in the first instance is actually to get you to do something. What I want you to do is, in the next two to three minutes, speak with your neighbour, and if you don't have a neighbour, you might want to move a little bit closer. <laughs> and if you have the opportunity to record your answers on a piece of note paper or something, that would be wonderful. But what I would like you to do is to think on this question here. You, one thing about these pointers is the moment you have any kind of a shake in your hand, it's amplified uh, here. What criteria would you use to identify a great university teacher. So two or three minutes, just talk about that, and let me say I'll spare you the embarrassment of asking for your comments back in a moment. I just want you to talk about it, the intent being to try to ensure that we're all beginning to think about what it is that's underpinning this talk. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. <laughs>
so I can I get a sense that things are beginning to abate and start, so let's let's move on. Um, that was also an opportunity for anyone who was running a little late to be able to sneak in in the back without being noticed. Um, hold your thoughts on that one and anything you may have recorded. We'll revisit that question in about 40 minutes' time. What I would like to do um, now is, if I can, just step back uh, to 1983 or thereabouts, a little bit of a personal uh, insight or anecdote to give you some sense of where the background to this talk lies. 1983, I had my first academic appointment. I had an honours degree, I was 23 years old, and I was appointed to Massey University in New Zealand, and my first task within a month of appointment was to run an intensive program for a group of extramural students, people who were doing distance education within Massey University. So these students who came to the week-long intensive had spent a great deal of time and well, they invested a great deal of time and money to come to this intensive. They've taken time off work. They've left their families for a week to come along to this class. Uh, they were thoroughly committed to their work. And when they arrived, they came to my, this first lecture of mine and they were, without exception, older than I. They had a much greater diversity of life and professional experiences to draw from than I had. And I was terrified. I am not a natural public speaker by any means. Public speaking is probably, like for many people, one of my great fears. And so I had this group of people and I sat at the front of the room on a stool behind a very, very high desk with 30 or so of these much older people in front of me and I read my notes. I sat and every so often I would look up and there to my complete dismay amidst my pounding heart, my a, a blood pressure that must have been through the, the roof, a cold sweat, sitting in the back row of this group was my father. <laughs> now, I don't know what kind of a relationship you have with your father. My father is a fine enough fellow, but he's very critical. He's, he's, one, he's, a, he's by profession and by character, he is a critical man. And so I was thinking, why would my father be here? He lives five hours away. He's never experienced, er, expressed any desire to come to any lecture of mine, but there he was. So my head went right down into my notes. I, as I said, I was terrified. After about an hour, I began to realize that, in fact, it wasn't my father, but it was a student who bore an uncanny, <laughs> uncanny resemblance to my father. So this first hour, this first encounter with any kind of uh, serious university teaching in my first academic appointment was thoroughly miserable. I realized very quickly after that hour that what I needed to do was to, A, rethink the way that I ran my classes because I couldn't continue, if I was to have a career in this field, I couldn't continue to do this kind of thing without completely damaging my ego, my, you know, my self-belief, any kind of a faith I had in myself. I had, I had to change. And at the same time, it was also very, very much apparent to me that the audience, the students who were there, were people from whom I ought to be drawing, from whom other students should be learning. They had much more experience than I had. So uh, that was one thing that took me... So after that initial experience, I developed a little bit of an interest in teaching and learning as well as in my disciplinary field. And that was expressed over a number of years as I went to the US as a teaching assistant and I worked with colleagues and we wrote papers and we thought about how to make teaching more effective and efficient and so on. And in due course, I ended up at Flinders University in South Australia, where I currently am. And in, in the early 2000s, I was asked by the university if I might uh, put together an application for a national teaching award. So I did that. And I wrote something uh, following the criteria that was set out. And I submitted a draft to a colleague of mine from the physical sciences. And he came back. And, and you'll recall from the introduction, one of my areas of interest has been qualitative research methods. And this physical scientist came back having read my uh, <coughs> reflections and he commented it, it was bloodless. He said, where's you in this? This is completely impersonal. What's it actually like to be in your classroom? What, how, 
we don't get a sense of that from all of this. And I mean, I was quite taken aback because, as I said, my interest has been in qualitative research methods, getting people into research, hearing those voices. So I revised the application, and, and lo and behold, things were successful. But what, what that prompted for me was to think, well, what, what are other people who are doing? What are other people who have been acknowledged in one way or another as good university teachers? What are they doing? What's going on in their classrooms? So I was, I was just interested in that. And so much, as some, some of you will be aware, a great deal of teaching goes on behind closed doors, despite things like rate my professor and peer review of teaching and the like. Teaching is still one of the more private of the professional activities. So I was really interested to know what is it that really good teachers are doing? And so that underpinned um, work which led to this book here, uh, which came out late last year, and it also underpins the structure of this talk today. What I want to do in the, in the time that is available to us and left is, first of all, is to look at some windows on uh, successful tertiary teaching, taking as our lead question that one, what makes a great university teacher? And in terms of those windows, what I'm just going to be looking at is the kind of criteria that have been used at a national level to make determinations about this. Second, what I want to do is to give a very brief over overview of um, the autoethnographic approach that I adopted in this, what that means and, and what it, some of its uh, liabilities. And then finally, to come to the core point is what do these inspiring academics actually have to say? What inspires them? What inspired them? Um, what were their how and why stories? So that's where we're going. The point of this is not to uh, come up with any kind of a bag of tricks. This talk is not going to be about the specific techniques that people have used. Um, to answer one of the questions in, in, the, in the introduction, I'm not going to talk about specific cases of things that, that people have adopted. Um, it, there are many, many wonderful publications on specific techniques and devices that people can use for teaching and learning. There's websites, there's great books on, and things on uh, guidance on how to use clickers in large classes, how to run effective peer supervision groups, peer writing, role plays in classes, and so on. And there's these terrific books like McKeechee's Teaching Tips, which is in about its 15th edition. Boyce's book on advice to new faculty members, which encourages moderation in all things, moderation in research, moderation in teaching, acting all the time but waiting for the right time. And a more recent publication, Aspiring Academics, an edited collection by Solem, Foote and Monk, uh, which also uh, follows on from some of these sorts of ideas. So, in, t in part, this lecture is going to be the story of, of this book. Um, what I wanted to do was to think, well, what are some, what are some of the national approaches to determining what constitutes a, an effective or really good teacher, going back to that question that I asked you at the outset. And I also wanted to see if I could use one of the frameworks from one of those national bodies to provide a structure to the book. So my search was confined to some degree to English-speaking countries, but not entirely. And what I found was that there, are, uh, there appeared to be about five countries which offer major national teaching awards, the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. So I looked at the criteria that they use in the first instance to see what is it that these countries think or recognize as constituting the characteristics of really, really effective teachers. And in the United States, there's sort of, in the US Professors of the Year Awards, there's really three fundamental issues that they look at. The impact that uh, faculty members have on students, issues of scholarship, and then contributions to education more generally. They also solicit letters of uh, support and the like from, uh, I'm going to blame that handshake on coffee that I had this afternoon, actually. <laughs> There in New Zealand, the Ako Aotearoa uh, Awards for Teaching Excellence, they look at th uh, four main areas. The first one, look at, looking at people's capacity to de design for learning. So curriculum development, for instance. Secondly, facilitating learning. So an enthusiasm, the respect that the faculty member has for students. 
Third is evaluating learning and teaching. So whether or not you use student evaluations of teaching, how you use them, whether you engage with the employers of your students to see whether or not what you're doing is actually effective, um, whether or not you're um, making appropriate use of things like you know, formative and summative assessment and so on. And then, as usual, the professional development and leadership. Are you leading your colleagues? Are you engaged? Are, are you constantly trying to develop? And then there's the UK Professional Standards Framework. And this is the framework that they use to award fellowships, uh, senior fellowships, and now their principal fellowships and the like. So they use, there's, a, there's a very, very extensive array of criteria here for working out what constitutes a, an effective university lecturer or teacher. They all, it's also an underpinning for a very um, useful professional development program. But this framework focuses on three main areas. One is what you actually uh, do, the areas of activity that are set out there. So developing effective learning, for instance, uh, here. And then there's what you actually know both within your core discipline and pedagogically. So do you have subject expertise? If you're a physicist, do you know about physics? But at the same time, you're not just a physicist, you're also a teacher. So what is it you know about pedagogy and how do you put those things together? And then the third area has to do with values, the commitment that you bring to work and the respect that you have for students. And then finally, as it happens, um, there's the, the Australian uh, Learning and Teaching Committees uh, or Councils criteria. And they have five main areas that they look at. And the first one is this approaches to teaching that might influence and inspire students to learn. So what do you actually do as a faculty member to support individual learning? How do you link your research and your teaching as the second point? So again, here, not only do you have to have a command of your field, but what they're looking for is the capacity to put that command of the field into your teaching in effective ways, and perhaps even draw back from it as well. How can you advance your research from your teaching? And the third area is a thoughtful and a useful assessment, and finally, uh, or set fourth point rather, dealing with students as individuals, recognizing uh, its students as human beings, as individuals, not part of a large group and then finally scholarly activities. As it happens, I ended up settling on using the Australian Learning and Teaching Council's criteria as the framework for the book for a number of reasons. It seemed, the core ones being that it seemed that it actually, it, it was relatively straightforward. It embraced many of the other things that were covered within the UK and the US and other uh, national systems. Um, and well, those were those were probably the the main sorts of reasons. So those, what I did was I then went to uh, colleagues around the world. I asked two dozen academics who had received major national teaching awards in five countries if they would write 2,500 word reflections on following those five areas. I asked them to tell their how and why stories and that they all had to be informed by scholarly work. So they weren't autobiographic accounts, they were autoethnographic accounts, which is what I'm going to come to now. So what I was asking these people to do was to write autoethnographies that described what they were doing in, by way of their teaching. Now, Liam Patong, who is a, a, an Australian scholar, uh, ex with a good deal of uh, expertise and background in uh, qualitative research methods, makes the point that the aim of eth autoethnography is to tell the story of the personal so that others might reflect on their own experiences. I'll come back to that point in a little while. But what I was, I did, I did not actually tell the contributors to this book that they were going to be engaged in autoethnography. In part, well, there's a long story that lies behind that, and I'm very glad that I didn't, because quite frankly, I think it might have put some of them off. And so if I can just distinguish ethnography from autobiography, say so again, autoethnography from ethnography and autobiography, you, most of you will be familiar with the notion, uh, with ethnograph ethnography. We might have a stereotypical kind of a depiction of a, a pith-helmeted, 
colonial anthropologist visiting a primitive tribe in a remote area and writing a dispassionate perspective, a Western perspective, of what's going on in that community. So it's, the idea is, excuse me, I won't even bother with that, making sense of the other. <coughs> and so it's a detached viewpoint. Autoethnography emerged out of post-colonial and post-modern sensibilities. It changes the relationship between the self and the other. There's a bit of a blurb there about it. And if I could try to characterize the differences between these, the three areas, autobiography, eth ethnography, and autoethnography. Um, or an autobiographer writes self without the other. Okay, that's self without the other. An ethnographer studies the other without the self. An autoethnographer endeavors to treat the self as other. So the key features of autoethnography are that the autoethnographer is a full member of the group. So it's a bit like an anthropologist writing about anthropologists a university teacher writing about university teachers, a nurse writing about nurses. It's a not about writing about some other group. Analytic reflexivity is another part of this uh, whole idea. The author is engaged in reflection. It's not simply uh, sort of a, um, like an, an autobiography where there may simply be a chronological account of what went on. Reflection is part of the whole process. The narrator is visible. This is not written uh, in the third person. It's written in the first person. We know who the author is. It's not a dispassionate perspective. There's a dialogue with informants beyond the self. That is, it goes beyond autobiography, and it's engaged with literature in the area. So when I asked these contributors that I wanted scholarly informed accounts of their how and why practices, that was what that was getting at. And then there's a commitment to theoretical analysis as well, following on from that. So there's engagement with literature. So going back again to this idea that from um, Liampatong, but expressed in different words by McIlvain, the stimulus, the idea here is for these things to act as a stimulus uh, to open new intellectual vistas for the reader. Now, I will confess that there is an intrinsic problem. I mean, uh, here I am giving a public lecture, and I'm going to tell you what the problem is with the lecture. The book was written to try to encourage reflection so that when people read the book, they may reflect on their own practice. What I'm doing in this talk, and I'll come to it a little bit later on as well, is I've gone back through that book for the purpose of this lecture to try to isolate themes that emerged for me from it. Someone else who looks at the book will extract different sets of ideas. So I would say, well, what I'm going to talk about is what I drew from it, any one of you will look at it, and it, the different things will strike quite different chords. So, as I said earlier, I approached, I ended up with uh, 26 contributors. I actually asked for 27. The only person who said no to the offer was the person who had read my original application for a National Teaching Award, <laughs> who is a colleague of mine at my university. And he had a very good reason. He had just received a $70 million research grant and was trying to set up a national groundwater research center. So he said he could not squeeze anything else into the whole program. So the other people who contributed, what I tried to do here was to get a, a good representation. I wanted a gender balance. I wanted to try to get a seniority levels all sorted out. I wanted to get a very good disciplinary uh, mix. And um, I wanted to get, well, your discipline, as I mentioned. So I've got David Cahane from Alberta, who is a political scientist. Donna Boyd, not surprisingly, there as an anthropologist. Lisa Emerson, who won the New Zealand Prime Minister's Award as a creative writer. Mick Healy, who some of you will know about as a geographer and a very distinguished scholar in teaching and learning. Kathleen Reagan, uh, Spanish. Bernard Moss, who teaches spirituality and social work. Jane Dahlstrom, who's a pathologist. And then finally, Carl Wieman, who some of you will know, won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2001 and was also the US Professor of the Year in 2004. Just to make the point that you can win a Nobel Prize and be an extraordinarily good 
lecturer or academic at the same time. So these people very, very kindly wrote for me the two and a half thousand words structured around those issues that I set out earlier. So the question is, what did they say? I have to say, every one of these things that I've seen was a complete and utter delight. I, I rejoiced in reading them. They were wonderful. They were really, they were, uh, it was, it was one of the best pieces of work that I've actually had the privilege to engage in. I, I just enjoyed it. But almost all of them also said to me they had a terrible time writing it, that it was one of the most difficult things that they had ever written, if, including Lisa Emerson, the, uh, the creative writer. I think maybe it wasn't sufficiently creative for her. <laughs> so the thing is, well, what, as I said, what was it that they happened to say? Well, I've... In my rereading of the book for the purposes of this uh, talk, I've isolated seven themes that, that came out of their representations for me. So seven themes that I think that make them um, inspiring lecturers, things that have inspired them over time. And the first one is that many made the point that they had been forced or felt that they had to move beyond failure, fear, and uncertainty and that they had learned to work as fallible learning collaborators. Now, some of you who have read Parker Palmer's book, The Courage to Teach, will know that he talks quite a bit about fear. And fear is something that pervades a great deal of teaching. It pervades a great deal of learning as well. So we have here, for instance, David Kahane made the observation that he was miserably anxious starting out as a teacher. I mean, you can imagine, these all resonated with me. I've uh, given you my account of my first lecture. Um, Wendy Rogers had disastrous student feedback in the first instance. And then Rona Free, students just seemed relieved when I stopped talking. <laughs> and these are people who are, have won, you know, they've been acknowledged by students, by their peers and the lot as exemplary university teachers, and many of them had these thoroughly shaky starts. The second point, the theme that emerged, was that they reflected. As Dewey said, we don't learn from experience, we actually learn from reflecting on experience. Many of the, the people who contributed to this made the observation that they were never expert. They never felt expert as teachers. Um, that every class, every student was different. And I'm sure you, many of you will, will understand that. Every time you come to a new group of people, there's a different dynamic. Something different is going on. They're, and they're always facing new challenges that led them to um, reflection and revision and a transformation. So one of the observations I would make is that these inspiring academics are all works in progress. They're always changing. The third point that came out was there was a realization, I think, that teaching was something rather more than knowledge mastery. There was certainly an acknowledgement that one, in order to be an effective or an inspiring teacher, you did have to have a good command of your field. But that wasn't enough alone, a point that I've uh, suggested a little bit earlier. The need to add uh, how does one enthuse students? How does one motivate them? One of the really, really critical things for these inspiring academics, not surprisingly, was sparking curiosity, getting students to be really interested in learning. And so that's where you need to go back to those, not, I, I don't mean to be demeaning when I say the bags of tricks, but the specific techniques and the like that help, can help to encourage that. Um, so Ian Cameron from Queensland noted, it's not, simp it's not simply knowledge that counts, it's the need to combine this with passion and love in seeking to excel. Another point that several made was that learning is rather more than teaching. And the sense I got from reading this, if, if we think about teaching and what is now been characterized, I guess, as the ba a banking model of education, where students might be regarded as empty vessels into which one downloads knowledge or information. Um, so th there's, a, there's a good deal more to this, and there was a real emphasis on what it is that the students do rather than on what it is that, that the lecturer or the faculty member does. 
So Schwartz really makes the, the point in this, uh, this first quote this from one of the chapters. Uh, we have to recognise that what students put into, do during and get out of classes are more important for learning than what the teacher does. So the emphasis is on what the students are being asked to do and not what the, uh, the teachers are getting to do. And Reagan, Kathleen Reagan, picking up all, I guess probably almost um, maybe wittingly or deliberately on Paulo Freire's ideas from the pedagogy of the express that um, it says teaching is not about transmitting information. Uh, it's about creating a community of learners. The next point, the fifth one, was acknowledging, as a clumsy phrase, humanness, both their own and that of their students. Um, Mike Wesch made the observation uh, in, in his uh, talk, in his paper, he recounted an experience that he had as a candidate for an assistant professorship at Kansas State University. And the night before he was due to go and give a lecture, which was meant to be somehow uh, representative of his capacity to be a teacher, he was terrified. He knew that his career before him depended very much on this 50-minute engagement, and he wasn't too sure what to, what to do and how to approach it and the like, and he had a conversation with his wife who reminded him of something that had been said by a contestant in American Idol. It's amazing where these sources of inspiration comes from, isn't it? <laughs> um, Diana DeGamo, who I, b I believe was runner-up in, the, in uh, the year. And she had said on TV, love your audience and your audience will love you back. And when Mike's um, wife mentioned this to him, it changed his whole approach to what he was going to be doing in that lecture. It's sort of the usual idea of trying to picture or imagine your audience as, as being humans, that it's not an audience, it's a group of individuals who all have needs and with whom you need to try to engage. There was also a, a real sense of, uh, from the people of acknowledging their own strengths and uh, weaknesses. So Rona Free, she knows and she said that she's not good at leading discussions. So instead of hammering away at that and continuing to do that maybe because that was what everyone else was doing, she decided that she was going to change the way that she ran her classes and achieved much more effective ends. So she replaced the lecture time with a series of other activities that drew from her strengths and yet provided the students with the learning opportunities that they needed. Organising for risk. This is one where a, a number of uh, the contributors suggest, and this ref uh, picks up on some conversations that I've had in the last day with members of people from the CDTL, um, and that is trying to create arrangements in terms of timetabling and, for want of a much better phrase, content delivery that allow opportunities for flexibility and responsiveness to what's going on in the broader community within the classroom. So let us say, for instance, you're teaching political science at this university. The current tensions between Japan and China are cl would clearly be of immense interest and, and value. Now, one could try to roll through a tightly structured curriculum which had been set up months or years ahead of this specific set of events, completely ignoring what's going on in the outside world. Or you can try to arrange a curriculum that makes space for those things, that makes space for you to try to bring the outside into the classroom, that makes space to engage with current events, that makes space for students to engage with you in a discussion about those things. And so that was this idea about organising for risk, or organising for opportunities as well. And then the seventh and the final one, um, a number of people made the observation that they had had teachers who inspired them and they tried to replicate those behaviours. Or, in some instances, exactly the opposite. So Ian Cameron, a chemical engineer, uh, a very, very lovely fellow, makes the observation, I was determined not to replicate some of the practices inflicted on me but instead to mirror those of the most dedicated teachers I had experienced. So in other words, inspiring, and dare I say it, uninspiring teachers inspire future great teachers. 
So those seven themes, what I'd like to do now briefly, and we're getting towards the end, is how does this, those, those seven themes compare with some other work that's been done in the area? Now, some of you will be aware of Ken Bain's work, um, a book that he published in 2004 called What the Best College Teachers Do. Now, this was an award-winning publication. It was um, based on an intensive study of 36 professors at 24 universities across the United States. And Bain isolated six sorts of practices and ideas that characterize what best, the best college teachers do in his, um, uh, in his reflections. First of all, they've got a good deal of subject expertise. We've talked a little about that. They take their teaching very, very seriously. They have high expectations of their students and also of themselves. Fourth, they try to make learning relevant. So again, trying to engage with what's going on in the outside community. They trust that students want to learn. I know that in some institutions it can become very easy to think there's students who are here simply to, to get a degree, simply to get a piece of paper that says they've been to a specific institution rather than actually trying to take something on board to learn to change. And then also have a systematic program, some way of reviewing their own efforts. So what I'd like to do just now is to merge Bain with the themes that I pulled out of my own book to suggest maybe what the characteristics of an inspiring university teacher might be. Bearing in mind the observations I made a little bit earlier about how I've misused, arguably, the material that came from those autoethnographies. And as I say, in the end, what I'm doing is, is um, saying, on the basis of my reflections of what these autoethnographies convey, these are what we have. So first of all, an inspiring academic moves beyond failure, fear, and uncertainty and learns to work as a fallible uh, co uh, collaborator or co-learner. They know their subject very, very well, but they also appreciate that teaching involves a good deal more than simple subject mastery. Third, they appreciate that learning is a little bit different from teaching. They treat all elements of teaching as intellectual endeavors. They te take their teaching seriously. They organize for risk. They create natural and exciting learning environments. They acknowledge humanness, their own and that of their students. They have a strong trust in their students. They display openness. They believe their students want to learn. They replicate and improve on, and that's important, their own inspiring teachers. And then finally, they have a systematic program of reflection to assess their own efforts and to make appropriate changes. Now, what I'd like to do, you recall I asked you at the outset of this session if you would think about what the criteria are that constitute a great university teacher or an inspiring academic. What I'd like you to do now is to revisit that with your trusty neighbor. Consider how your thoughts on that question, what criteria would you use to identify a great university teacher? How do they compare with that summary, which I'll put back on in a moment? And for instance, what points of commonality or difference emerge? Is there anything that has been covered that shouldn't have been or vice versa? So that's the uh, list. So again, if I give you another couple of minutes to reflect on that, and then I'll just have a very, very few words to conclude. Okay, so.
Okay. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt and stifle the conversation, but I think what I would like to do is to ensure that some time is left for, to continue that conversation over tea or coffee or whatever. I think there's something programmed for after this event. As again, I'm not going to ask you or embarrass you. Um, what I'd like to do now is just to move to a couple of words of, uh, of conclusion. And I'd like to borrow some words, or the words, from Ken Bain, who I referred to earlier, who made the, uh, this observation. We cannot take single pieces of the patterns noted here, this kind of thing, and simply combine them with other less effective or even destructive habits and expect them to transform someone's teaching any more than adopting Rembrandt's brush strokes would by it themselves replicate his genius. We must understand the thinking, attitudes, values and concepts that lie behind pedagogical masterpieces. Observe practices carefully, but then begin to digest, transform and individualize what we see. To take the Rembrandt analogy a step further, the great Dutch artist could not be Picasso any more than the Spanish uh, painter could replicate his predecessor. Each had to find his own genius. So must teachers adjust every idea to who they are and what they teach. Thank you very much. Question, please put your hand up and then uh, the mic will come to you. Yes, there's a question there. Please make them easy. <laughs> That's my um, I'll, I'll speak loudly. Thank you for a really comprehensive and uh, encouraging talk. Uh, in all the breadth of the um, various factors, and I'd like to have another think about that breadth, you didn't mention um, emotion or feelings so much. You're mostly focusing on the kind of cognitive approach. Mm -hmm. I remember a, a very inspiring teaching a teacher from my first days at the University of Canterbury, uh, who was uh, passionate about Shakespearean plays. And the word passion and emotion didn't come up in the list. I'm wondering where that fits. Mm. Um, that, that's actually a, a very, uh, that's a really, really interesting point because like you, my, my recollections of some of the really in, inspiring academics or inspiring teachers I've had have been passionate. And what, what I remember about them was the passion, not necessarily the content, it was the vast enthusiasm they brought for the material. Um, and I, I recall at Canterbury, a lecturer and geographer or, or almost in tears discussing um, developers' plans for a, a beach spit that involved people losing their homes. So he'd just been an expert witness at uh, the case. So, I mean, the point you make is, is a, actually it's a very good one. And to tell you the truth, despite how vitally important that is, I don't recall that actually coming up in any of the commentaries that were written. Um, and, to, you know, that seems to be a remarkable oversight. Because, I, I mean, I would agree. I saw nodding as you raised that question. I mean, clearly this is something that um, many, many people feel, uh, understand, appreciate. So, uh, fair point. I agree. Thank you very much. Um, I thought your opening anecdote reflected something quite fundamental about how we become university teachers in the first place and the sort of traditional model of lecturing and dispensing information to a passive crowd. Uh, and the phrase that really resonated for me and some of the uh, principles you were expounding was mm -hmm. the one about creating a community of learners, which mm -hmm. would suggest turning that on its head and handing it back to the students. I know you said you wouldn't give us a bag of tricks, mm -hmm. uh, but I would be interested to hear you say a bit more about that, uh, especially if you have uh, an academic community of students who tend to be 
rather passive and quiet in the Singapore context, and often we have to coax them mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, out I'm of their shells. Uh, could you <laughs> give us a few more uh, tips or details about uh, how one does it? My sense is probably there are many people here much better qualified to be able to talk about the particular circumstances here. I mean, I think you know, that, that idea of creating a community of learners is, um, is, is, a very, is a very good one. And I think it's probably also something that can be much more easily achieved in some discipline areas than others. And I, I, to be quite frank, I think that, for instance, in some of the social sciences, it may be easier than it is in some of the physical sciences. Um, Although I'd be delighted to hear from some physical scientists who may be able to offer different sorts of perspectives on that. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I think I, I've been blessed in that uh, the institution that I work at is characterized by an extraordinarily diverse student population, um, at least 50% of whom are mature age learners. They've had work experience of all sorts. Um, there's a, there's a lots of experience to draw from. And to be frank, it's very difficult to shut people up. It's, it's to create a, a group of community of learners, to be able to get people to engage in classes and in small groups is relatively easy. But I think um, some of the ways of doing it are, are um, it helps, I suppose, to have you know, an articulate group of, uh, not so much articulate, um, a feisty group of students that helps. Um, trying to, uh, smallish class sizes, projects that allow students to work in small groups on things that are relevant to them and to their interests, um, so and, uh, where possible to their day-to-day -day lives or where they might see their careers going and, li and the like. So um, the kind of example that I use, what, one that I have going at the moment, is that I have a group of second-year geography students, many of whom are going to end up being social planners and social workers. And an assignment that they have in their tutorials and that the work is that as groups, they have to be consultants who are consulting to a local council to talk about how that council can cope in the future with an aging population. How are they going to create a council area that suits uh, th their aging population or works for them? So they can see that there's career um, outcomes that are associated with that. They're working on projects that are linked to the area that they live in, because I've tried to link it as closely as possible to the specific local government areas that they live in and so on. So I think it's um, trying to in break down barriers to communication, small groups, relevant projects that people can see as being linked to their, their own futures as possibilities. I mean, that's just to start. I'd be delighted to talk about other ways as well. It's I have to confess that I almost didn't come this afternoon. I'm delighted you did. Nice uh, to see you again. Thank you. I'm delighted I did as well. <laughs> but the reason I almost didn't come is because I had some research to finish. <laughs> and uh, what do your uh, inspiring academics have to say to those of us in a university that is aspiring and in some ways achieving mm -hmm. world-class research, where we do feel a deep contradiction mm in terms of time requirements between the aspiration to have a Nobel laureate in the university, mm. to mm -hmm. deliver world-class yeah. research, yeah. and the reality of our teaching commitments mm -hmm. and seeking to be excellent there too. Yeah. Yeah. I feel a contradiction that you didn't talk about. Yeah, no. I mean, I think, I, I, I don't think it is um, as, I understand the point, and it's one that does get raised. And I, I don't think it's as difficult a contradiction as... I mean, I, you've published on teaching and learning issues yourself, I'm sure. Um, but it seems to me that one of the ways that you can begin to do it is um, to try to think about how you can... Well, how do I put this? Bringing bringing a scholarly, a scholarly approach to the teaching which also yields research outcomes built on that teaching. That's one way. So uh, the, the way that I have done some of this in the past has been to think, 
well, I've, I've got a research trajectory and I have a linked teaching trajectory. So if, if I can just go back to specific personal examples. When I first joined Flinders University, within minutes of arriving, somebody gave me an agenda, uh, this thick, I am not joking, for our faculty's social and behavioral research ethics committee. I found myself on the ethics committee. I didn't know nothing about ethics. And so I sat through these interminable meetings where we went through the agenda thinking about people's applications. And I started to develop an interest, believe it or not, in research ethics. And that underpinned some of the research that I did and also the teaching. So there was a three-way link between the service that was, I was engaged in at the university, the research that I was doing, which was on ethics and led to the establishment of a journal, and the teaching that I was doing where I was teaching research methods classes, for instance, and other areas that involve students in the conduct of research. So ethics was a natural part of that. So there were ways of linking those that led to research quanta um, that improved the quality of teaching and also, I think, made me a better contributor to what was going on in the universities. So I think, to the extent that it's possible, there's some real value in trying to find the ways in which those, the, the two areas can be enmeshed and linked. I, I, I think the thought process needs to be given to how can I make these things work, rather than a much easier, and I think the fallback position, which is to say they are separate and they can't meet. They can't be. Um, I do research and then I do teaching in, in my spare time to try and be, you know, so that I have the time to be able to do it. I think we have to collectively think how do we put these together? And the conversations that I had with, over lunch yesterday, I mean, it seems to me that NUS is trying, is, is making the point of trying to ensure that research and teaching go forward together. The institution that I'm at at the moment is giving greater emphasis to research and less to teaching, and I think, frankly, that's a mistake. I think that collectively we have to continue to do this. Future academics come from our current students. Um, we, uh, for in Australian universities, most of the funding comes from students. We have an imperative to serve students, as well as to do research, and those things have to go together. I, so I think, it, we, yeah, sorry to rant. It's, <laughs> we, we have to give our attentions to how do we make those things work. Good question. I mean, I'd love to talk about it some more. When I talk to my friends who are school teachers, they're horrified to learn that um, university teachers are let loose on students with zero education in the practice of education or the kind of themes you've been talking about this afternoon. I'd be astonished if more than 1% of NUS's population of assistant professors we're here this afternoon because the signal that they receive is no, don't go to that lecture, you ought to be getting on and writing another paper. Mm -hmm. um, and universities talk about taking this seriously but don't. Mm -hmm. what, what should we do to uh, demonstrate the importance of this point by actually doing something? Well, I mean, I, I think the si a simple answer to that, and it's because it's simple, it's probably wrong, <laughs> is um, to ensure that there are institutional mechanisms and reward systems that actually encourage that kind of that activity and behaviour. So I, I do not know how the promotion system at the National University of Singapore works, how it rewards contributions to teaching and to service and the like. But I know very well that at my own university we have a very, very clear set of profiles that make it absolutely clear that if you wish to be promoted from lecturer to senior lecturer to, uh, and ultimately to professor, you must fulfill all of these things. Then you have to have a balance on four areas. Research, teaching, service to the broader community and service to the university. And people's careers stall. 
they get to associate professor, for instance, because they haven't got the, the, tr the teaching credentials. The university is serious about this. You can be an extraordinarily good teacher, a researcher, doesn't necessarily mean you will be promoted to professor if you have not satisfied the four areas. So I, I mean, I would have thought that was the simplest way of sending the signal, and which gets back to the previous question about this relationship between uh, research productivity and teaching productivity. I mean, the unfortunate thing, I think, as well, is that um, you know, no institution is an island as well, and in US, like any other institution, competing with other organizations, which may give a great deal of attention to research and much less to teaching. And that puts the academics in this terrible position where in order to be globally competitive, they have to be working twice, three times as hard to sustain a teaching trajectory, a service trajectory, and to be able to match people in other institutions where research is being disproportionately rewarded or acknowledged. Yes, you. Yes, the front. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have a, I have a question relating about this uh, student and professor relationship. I mean, how really can we define it to be the more proper? Because normally people will have to, for example, if we are like uh, in the role of a parents, talk to their children, we have one way of talking. Or alternatively, they have uh, some other discussions regarding student as a customer or as a client. So they come here to university, they just like go to Burger King to buy a burger. So they are expecting us to be like a sort of entertaining role as well. So this is really sort of like confusing because if you define how you behave yourself as a teacher, how you deliver your message to the student. So well, how do you really define a relationship between uh, the teachers and the student in the university? Mm. So how do, I de how do I define the relationship between teachers and students? I mean, the point to make that there is clearly a, a significant change that, well, I think there is a, a fairly major change going on towards, again, from the experience with which I'm most familiar in the Australian context, towards this kind of client relationship. I've paid my fees, and so therefore I expect to get a degree. I may come to classes, but I may not. Um, and that, that does, does create a problem. And I, I think it's, it's, um, it can be very easy to get uh, caught up in that as an academic and to begin to disregard uh, or, or change the ways that you think about students, um, to, to see them as customers rather than as people who wish to learn. And it goes back to one of those observations about acknowledging the humanness of um, students as well as oneself. But again, if I can go back to the observations that two people have made about the research teaching relationship. If, for instance, you're in an institution where students are increasingly regarding the, their relationship as a client uh, or a customer relationship rather than a student-teacher relationship, and you're experiencing pressures which are driving you to research and away from teaching, seems to me one of the outcomes of that is it's very easy to say, OK, well, I give up on teaching. I'm going to spend my time on research. Because the st whatever I do for the students is not necessarily going to be particularly well acknowledged or received by them. They're here for the degree. I need to ensure that all I do is provide them with the, the basic material, the, the minima, uh, to be able to fulfill that objective rather than to provide them with a, a wonderful learning experience. Again, picking up on one of Bain's themes. So I think what we, uh, again, call me Pollyanna, um, but I think we have to try to resist that idea of students as clients and remember they are, you know, that students, to try to hold on to the idea that students do want to learn and that if exciting opportunities are provided to them, they will avail themselves of them and they'll make the most of them and, and try to learn. And, um, an observation that I've made elsewhere is that over time I've seen people begin to close the doors of their offices 
to engage less frequently with students. And in part, I think it's part of this whole process as well. And that disconnection between academic staff and students helps to sustain a, a um, poisonous client relationship that I don't think is good for higher education. Thanks. Can we wrap these up? Sure. Yes. Yeah, we'll Thanks. Is there time for one last yeah, comment last or question? question. Yes. yes. Mm. I think uh, we are in very troubling times. You know, I've been an educator for, for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. I've retired, but still an educator at heart mm -hmm. because I teach uh, prisoners now. Anyway, I think towards the end of my career, there was this great, what I, sh I should say, the commodification of education. Mm -hmm. And we use words like uh, clients mm -hmm. and customers. And uh, there was also evaluation of teachers and all that. And having taught for so long, I could see the change. And I was caught. Do I play to the gallery? Or do I be true to myself? You know? I mean, if you want to be pragmatic, students do like teachers who give them higher grades, things like that, right? And they might grade you according to the grade they give you. <laughs> I was aware of that. But I was lucky because it was at the end of a career. I didn't care. I just taught according to my beliefs. Whatever they create me was besides mm. the point. But I think, really, one has to be really strong in one's beliefs, you know, to have that passion burning, mm. to be the, the educator. Although there are influences all around you that might militate against that. Mm -hmm. And if you keep that fire burning, a few students will catch that and they will uh, appreciate whatever you have done. And I must say that the reward is not always immediate, mm -hmm. you know. Having taught this great length of time, I have students who come to me seeing me and then suddenly they will go, they catch me in a cafe and then they went and buy a, a little cake for me. And I say, thank goodness, I'm still alive after 30 years <laughs> having taught them. And I got that reward. Mm -hmm. And it was because a student tells me that I remember you so well and uh, you taught me and I enjoyed your mm -hmm. class or something. And let me buy you this as a gift or something. So it wasn't an immediate thing. It's just like an appreciation mm -hmm. when they have grown up, they remember you. Mm -hmm. So I think I'd like to leave yeah. uh, No, I mean, I, th I think uh, that's, that's a wonderful point about how uh, the, the impact can be uh, very, very long lasting. People remember great teachers for a very long time. We've already heard at least one account of that from the questions. Um, uh, about passion and the like this afternoon. Going back to the, early, the observation you made about the commodification of teaching, and that picks up on a couple of other questions as well. I, um, the former chair or head of the Australian Learning and Teaching Council, gave a talk that I went to a while ago, and he made an observation that I thought was really quite telling. Um, and that was that people often bemoan the way that higher education is going. I mean, there are the issues about client-customer relationships and, and the much greater level of surveillance that is, occurs within teaching and so on. But he also made the point that university teaching, think about the experiences that you had as a student at, your, at universities that you may have gone to. And think about how much better the learning opportunities are in general in those institutions now. now. I'd like to think there's actually been quite a substantial improvement and change over time. I think there is much, much more attention given to pedagogical issues now than there has been in the past. I think there's much greater use of appropriate technologies. Students have greater access to resources and I think those students who are good and capable and inspired and wish to learn can do marvellous things. They can exceed anything that we do because the opportunities are there for them now. So while there have been some punishing and unfortunate effects that are associated with some of the transformations in higher education, I think that at the same time, 
there's been enormous improvements, just sea changes in higher education and sea changes for the good. Yeah. Thank you all for those wonderful questions and thanks to Ian for candidly and comprehensively answering those questions. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Prof Hay, again, for the wonderful lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for us to present a token of appreciation to Prof Hay. This token is a book about Singapore, entitled Singapore Sketchbook, An Island Observed. This book is a celebration of streets and buildings, classic scenes and marvellous architectural details around the country. The watercolour paintings were drawn by Graham Byfield, an accomplished artist who have lived and worked in Singapore for most of the 1980s and early 1990s. The text of this book is written by Gretchen Liu, one of the foremost authors on Singapore's architectural heritage. And now, we would like to invite Provost to come up on stage to present the token of appreciation to Professor Hay. Prof Tan, please. Next, we would like to invite Provost to present a bouquet of flowers as a token of appreciation to the Wong family. Dr. Alan Wong will receive on behalf of the family. Thank you very much, Provost. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this afternoon's lecture. We would now like to invite you to enjoy the tea reception which we have prepared for you. Tea is served outside the auditorium. Thank you and good afternoon.